jump on that again. So it, this is, if you can believe it, April 20th. We have two more weeks here and then we graduate. Two weeks from Saturday. Is anyone graduating? Yeah. Are you, are you going to come to graduation Saturday? Yep. My hood came in the mail today. <laughs> nice. I am not, but I am having a Mai Tai and tie dye party. <laughs> so, <laughs> my husband and I are in full party planning mode for that. Good. good. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> if you have, if you do make a good tie dye, take a picture of of the tie dye and put it in, put it in with your your final paper. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my ties, that's that's that this is the time. It might even be 60 degrees. You know? That's what I'm hoping for. I know. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. <laughs> that's all we want. I know. Yeah. We, we don't want it. It's it's horrible to be in that uh, that what cross center and, and it's a cold day. It seems all that much more just in remote. Anyway, so great. See you, Brian. We'll we will definitely see you there, Justin, maybe next year. Uh, uh yeah, I think I have to wait till next year, right? Because I won't. I have another two classes I have to take. I'll take them in parallel, but I won't be done until June. Well, well they, they let they let you graduate, but we only do the marching and all that pomp stuff once once a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, no. yeah. Okay, so let I'll me just go back. Sure. Let me just go back here and say I was using a, this tool called Visual Words V I. So it's it's a pretty simple website, visualwords.com gets you there. And all you do is type a word into this open box. And let's see, let's just do this one since this is the one of the topics of the day is mixed methods. Let's type that in there. And I don't know if I want to hyphenate it. We'll try it both ways. Oh, it hates that one. Doesn't like that one. If I hyphenate it, it might. Oops. So let's see. Let's let's go where we were. So if I say qualitative, it populates with quite an array of ideas. Some things I've never heard about. There's one right there. Oh, polarography. That's a that's qualitative. Huh. Okay. This is this is reading things quite different than what I would say. Chemical analysis is where that branch is. Qualitative, qualitatively. Now I see it's not really getting, it's not giving me much there. Well, if you click on the yellow at the top, does that way up the yellow bubble where it says a qualitative? I mean, what it does is it gives me a definition, but this is this is an interesting conundrum with the word qualitative, and that is sometimes qualitative simply means using words to describe a quantitative phenomenon. But at any rate, uh, we, that's that's where what do you call it? AI sometimes gives you something you want. Clearly, this is not giving me anything that I'm interested in as far as this goes. If I typed in a word like interview, it's a, a different story. But there, it may not even give me much more than I already, than you know already. Telephone interview. That's a that's a pretty 20th century word, huh? Should say Zoom. And at any rate, I am what the reason I'm trying to to emphasize this is that, as I said, the idea of your study can be portrayed in in a visual form like a map, and create a very effective way of conveying complexity. 
and allowing the viewer to interpret the complexity that you're trying to um, that you're trying to study. And on the one hand, we're trying to clarify and simplify. On the other, and, and what I say mapping is a way to convey complexity. It helps preserve the complexity in a way that isn't that isn't uh, that still has some boundaries to it. It still is conveying meaning and uh, uh, something that isn't um, isn't necessarily taking away from what you're doing, but amplifying or helping to explain the ideas, all the ideas that are churning uh, uh, in in your thinking. <clears throat> And I, um, I think that it's uh, you can see good examples in the um, book by Efron and Ravid. If you look at the textbook, they they have some pretty good simple visuals there. They don't really go up to what I would say is are are many uh, maps conveying the meaning of the study. So that's kind of the quest that I'm on. There's a there is the map conveying the meaning of the study, and then there's the thing that I've also asked you for the timeline. What happens when? And that's a very important graphic organizer for how to. And I want to talk about that uh, today. But um, let's just kind of pause here and and hit the reset button. So um, let's just get a sense of where you are a little bit. I know this. It, it's, I almost feel like I, I should back out and let you all talk for a while among yourselves. I hope I don't stifle a conversation with you guys, you know, but I know that's that's asking a lot, but um, yeah, where, Justin, where are you at right now? Kind of what's the... <laughs> uh, let's see. I, you know, I was really getting interested in this, like getting more quantitative data from peers and from people at the school. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's kind of, just kind of where I'm at. So I've been kind of trying to work on how to do that a little bit more because mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping to be able to kind of execute my plan <laughs> starting yeah. this weekend and get some emails out to people. Um, and then I was thinking like, wow, there's a lot of different um, stakeholders in my goal, which is to kind of create this department and kind of a model maybe that other schools will be able to take on. There's a lot of stakeholders, uh, you know, with administration, teachers, students, and even possibly the public. So I'm sort of trying to just sort of wrestle with which one of those I want to do in what, two weeks? Is that what we have? And, and kind of like, I mean, map that out. I know I won't get it done, but uh, but to really map out that plan of how that's going to work out. So. Right. And I think, you know, everything that you said, um, and especially the, the one, let me just talk for it, kind of go from backwards to forwards. The the stakeholders really is could be a very interesting map that you make because there are crossovers. There are parents who have children. There are parents who don't have children. There are parents who are, uh, there are teachers um, in, who have already been deeply involved in who what you're doing. And there are ones who are, you know, kind of the, the next group to work with and, and so on, the next step. Um, and same thing with your different grade level education leaders. So I think there's lots of interesting things to sort out who are the stake? Who are the stakeholders? And you could do you, this is one of those things you might think about. It's just creating that. Um, it, it it is a power list, but it's also something that be, can, could be configured as a map as well. Yeah, and you know, as you were saying that too, it made me think that really because it's I'm looking at it from a district. The stakeholders in the elementary school are a lot have a significantly different perspective than maybe those as a high school or even the middle school. Mm -hmm. <sighs> right. Uh, well, and, and I'll, I'll go on. Because a simple issue. It's got complicated. Though. Well, I know, but there's, but there's, you know, there's so many metaphors that you get to play with being a gardener. I mean, we all talk about the curriculum and learning is, is, you know, the garden. Well, you are the garden. So you get to play with the whole metaphor of what the garden yes, is. Yes. Yes. And I've done that quite a bit before. You know, I've used like fruit cheese mm -hmm. as examples or how mm -hmm. does, you know, how does an orchard work versus an individual tree and kind of like that whole network of a lot of teachers working. So there's a lot of parallels there for sure. I could definitely do that. But I think one of the things that you, that, that I would say is how do you prep the soil? How do you prepare? That's really where you where I think your work is. Yeah, sure. Creating that. Yeah. Is yeah. what do you do to create it? And I mean, I'm looking at my dirt right now. It's like I've got to start working on my dirt. 
Well, you read uh, the Mother Tree book or listened to it, so you should be doing that much to your soil. Maybe adding a little bit of compost on top. Well, that's well, okay. Invest no, in a broad I'll, fork and some compost, and then that's I'll, it. And just let the plants and the and the mycorrhizal fungi and the bacteria do all the work for you. Yeah. So, so I so it's something that of a misconception then in me that I should take a rototill out there and rototill right. it. I shouldn't right. touch it. Yeah, we all have this idea that we want to have that sort of cake mix, that brownie mix look to our gardens, but uh, you, all you're doing there is destroying bacteria colonies, destroying any fungi that existed, and then um, you're also uh, you know, diversity and equity, Courtney, uh, you're, you're taking all of these different soil structures that are like, you know, different chunks of soil, and yeah. you're making it completely homogeneous. Right. And you're basically turning it into the white bread of soil. Wow. And as you know, white bread compacts really easily, right? If you squish a ball of yeah. white bread, you're going to get this horrible compacted soil because all the soil particles are so evenly consistent. So take that for a metaphor. How you that's like, I got it. food, soil, diversity, equity. Brian, I'll work on bringing yours in too. I don't know how. Oh, no, no, no. I think, you see, I think that, the, you know, you, you have, you have to go with what you got. You know, those are, those are powerful, you know, uh, kinds of ideas. So I'm, and I'm glad I asked because now I don't have to do that rototilling. I can tell I'm gonna, it. You, Jeff, I'm, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy you a broad fork. How big is your garden? Uh, about 20 by 20 feet, maybe 25 yeah, I, by 25. I'll loan you my, I'll loan you my broad fork. I have, oh, a, no, I have, I have a broad, I have a broad fork. I, I bent one of the tongs. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I'll loan you a slightly heavier duty one. Uh, so. uh, time to get a new uh, one. Yeah. So just broad fork it, very yeah. lightly rake the top. You're good to go. Okay. Keep, All right. keep the weed though. That's good what I, that's well, what I see. say. Add some compost. This is even better. I like this cross interdisciplinary talk. Uh, yeah. But that's kind of like, true for the students right we don't want to it like, is you know we want to sort of like create the environment let the natural way that we're learning kind of, that's what a broad fork does right is that you kind of open the soil and it naturally fractures and then allows the roots and the water and the bacteria to kind of naturally go into where it's going to be mm -hmm. and what it's going to do and you're not just beating the snot out of it you know where you know, <laughs> take standardized tests you know follow these classes justin i don't know if i told you this but i um I used to work, so in in my undergrad experience, there was a teaching garden on our campus. Uh, I went to St. Mike's in um, in Colchester, Vermont, but there was a, a garden on our campus and actually the botany students and the education students um, had a partnership and we would invite school groups to the campus and do tours in the garden. So it was so neat because I, I didn't have any botany training, right? But the we were paired with the botany students and they would bring all the science knowledge. And I was just thinking of it as you were giving us all that info. And then, you know, we would, as the education department, we would, you know, figure out how we were going to interact with the groups and what activities and learning activities and books we would use. And it was just such a, a cool experience and I just it was like so formative and then later uh, that's next summer I actually worked with one of my professors and we made interpretive signage for the garden so people could visit on the weekend and have some sort of learning experience you know so um you know I need you, I need you to come into my garden Courtney and do that because <laughs> it's one of the things I've been we've been wanting to do for so long okay. maybe I'll, I'll hire you as a consultant well... to come in and help us <laughs> I did, you know, it's so funny because as an undergraduate, I, I like, you know, reached out to sign makers. The mm -hmm. guy I spoke with, he was like in the Midwest and, you know, we went back and forth and I designed them and then he made them and it was like the coolest experience. Like it was just different, you know? Well, <laughs> but, it's, very, uh, it's very practical, hands-on, uh, yeah. you know, you really, you're real, very real. Right. So what, yeah. what a fantastic opportunity. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Yep. And we, we even got to present about it, which was pretty neat at the um, NSTA National Science Teachers Association conference in San Francisco. We flew out and we talked about, it was so fun, but mm -hmm. it was, it was just, as you were talking about it, like all these happy, fun memories of the garden were coming up for me, but yeah. So, I mean, I just think it's, it's such a, I mean, the topic of your project and just the passion around the garden piece is just so cool. And I think 
so many people can connect with it, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. Thanks. Courtney. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, a lot of people can connect with it and that's, I've, I've been working with this group of 12 high school students because the science teacher is out with the, I think I might've mentioned this before. Uh, he's out have was because of surgery and, and it's a lot of kids that have like behavioral or, you know, they're autistic, you know, there's a lot of kind of exceptional students right in that class. And so it's kind of this constant challenge to keep them engaged because I, I spend a little bit of time indoors, but then when we go outside, they almost become totally different students and sort of like, how do you connect them with, right. with what's going on and stuff like that. So hopefully, I don't know, it's just sort of a practice model for me. I mean, it's a lot different than with the way I work with the little kids. Similarities, but different. But <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. I um I like the um the idea though because you're 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 it sounds like you're taking on as we as I wouldn't I'm not surprised though taking on many different roles and and um say teacher driven projects I mean here's students who need somebody and right. so they say, oh well alternative this is the alternative you know yeah teacher driven Ooh. yeah I mean my goal is to make student-driven projects ha happening there, but sort of like getting uh, them to say like what they want to do is, is a little bit tough for that particular group of students, so. Um, well, I, I understand that, but as you as you start to, I think, get uh, the opportunity to experience students who have, uh, you know, students who are, who are, what's our, I mean, students have special needs, students are alternative ed, students who are neurodiverse, I don't know, you know, different are just this great array of students which we all are there they are you know you said they transition from this one to the other they yeah outdoors makes things happen um so it's it's really great to hear and we'll come back to that um as we go along but let me just ask how uh how things are going for courtney how are you doing um i'm doing i'm doing well um i have been kind of reading a little more deeply some of my um some of my journal articles and things that I found it's interesting because I think a lot of the resources I'm finding are um are talking about strategies um for teaching social studies um which is great. A lot of them have to have links to um, comprehension strategies in reading, which I think was validating because a lot of what we do in fifth grade social studies is um, is teaching how to comprehend informational texts and have discussions about it. Um, we use a lot of graphic organizers, and I feel like that's been validated too through um, some of my reading. One of my interviews. Uh, one of my colleagues, she talked about, um, you know, her, what she used to do, and she doesn't do that anymore. And so it's interesting because they're, some of the articles that are written are actually sharing similar information. Like, we used to teach it this way, but there's a push to teach things this way now, um, you know, given a, a you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging lens. So it's been mm -hmm. interesting to um, do a little bit more reading about that. Um, you know, as a staff, we've we've been reading a book, um, Start Here, Start Now. Right. Um, and that's been great. Um, we've been, our professional development has been kind of centered around some of the strategies in that book. So you know, having that background has been helpful too. So I feel like I'm, some of what I'm reading is, is just about how to teach social studies. Some of what I'm reading has, has sort of more of a DIB lens, um, you know, talking about black history, talking about, um, you know, that's other, other groups. Um, but it just, it's kind of like two different types of articles, I guess. Some of them are more just this is how to teach social studies well, and this is how to think about incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion um, topics. And I think that's good because I think it's, my goal is to kind of bridge that in my project, um, mm -hmm. but I'm still figuring out how to, to bring it together. Um, so yeah, that's sort of where I'm at. Uh, I was hoping to look a little bit more at some of my interviews 
after our conversation last week, just to kind of see what other information I can pull out of them. Um, and I did one more interview that I've still yet to transcribe, but I'm slowly but surely getting there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that's where I'm at, I guess. Mm -hmm. sort of. Yeah. And you mentioned the, 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 the reading of the uh, start here, start now. I mean, these, these things are really great to have happening in the time that you're doing this action research. I think that what you're also saying, Courtney, is that, you know, while it's great to have things presented, it's kind of hard to, to, to really understand, you know, have that deep understanding of what you want there. It really does. I mean, as teachers, it takes a lot of time to think it through and make all the connections you want, right? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of right. Because I think what I'm finding, like I said, is I think some of what we've done has been validated by what I've been learning. Um, and so the question I guess is how am I going to um, dig in a little deeper with that? You know, how am I going to, to um, push that agenda a little bit further? Um, so I guess I, um, I'm trying to figure that out. I think like we've dabbled in concept mapping um, in Westward Expansion before we did sort of a final written response. And that seemed super positive for students. Like their writing was much better than it had been in previous years when we kind of were just like, okay, look at all your resources, now write something, yeah. you know? Um, so, you know, like I want to incorporate a little bit of that potentially as we get to the end of civil war and, and recon and talking about reconstruction. Um, but I'm just figuring out like what is feasible and what makes sense and, and what is our final product and outcome for students right like well, we have the, ideas but yeah one of the what so one of the ideas of of map of, of any of these things is that where do you start to use it and for what reason and one of the re, one of the ways to think about something like a map whether you want to do it as a class as a brainstorm or as a individual assignment over time they can be developmentally expanded based on where you are so it could be every couple of days like take your map out add add whatever you take it get a different color add add whatever new topics we have here because it's supposed to be messy learning and it's supposed to take take some of the that natural messiness this kind of gets back to your you know fundamental organic and um really embedded learning and start to help you see some patterns mm -hmm. Yeah. and look at some words that are important and then sh the other part to it is to then have your have your two or three children in the classroom talking with each other about what they see in their thinking mm -hmm. and this is the one tool that we have for actually displaying complicated thinking mm -hmm. yeah and i and i think for myself right now I keep thinking oh I gotta stop and map this out you know <laughs> because I keep like my um right I you see. know I have a lot that I'm thinking about so I kind of feel like I need to just sit down with some paper and start figuring out the through line um so I'm in a I guess I'm in a similar spot <laughs> well okay okay let me just okay here's here's one of the things that I want you to think about one of them is uh, and I think for everybody, it's time to stop adding more stuff. Mm -hmm. You can't add anything more. This is it. I'm t I'm going to give you the, I'm dropping the flag. It's the, it's, you know, the green flag, last lap. <laughs> so you can go for it, but know that this is a time when adding is going to subtract from your deeper thinking. Mm -hmm. This is the less is more time. This is when you need to give yourself the time to go into this. No more interviews that that relate to this. Although, please talk to people, but just know that you, you'll have to just like put it on a post-it and stick it somewhere. Not in here. 
And that's all, that's fine. I mean, you could say, I, you know, I'm, this is continuing. Then the other thing <clears throat> is, you know, if you're going to, to um, think about quantification, you should already kind of be there. Like Brian, you've already thought about quantif quantifying a survey, but if, and collected data, if you're th still thinking about it and thinking, how, how am I going to do this? It might be better to say here, I'm going to just, you know, like you're saying, Justin, do my chat GPT routine with myself and come up with a survey and kind of validate this with some people and I'll send it out next round. And I think we talked about this, that the outcome of this action research might be the next step that you take anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because otherwise you're just, you'll be adding and adding and adding. And then, then it's the panic of trying to incorporate, pulling everything together will just exhaust you. Well, I think that's where I am exactly. <laughs> I think I'm at the point where I I think I have what I need, but I'm trying to figure out how it comes together. So I think, um, yeah, that's definitely where I think I'm at. Well, okay, so get those post-its out or get if you if you're if you're you want to go straight to a you know like a mapping activity. But if you want to use your post-its, start writing your post-its and then start arranging them into whatever kind of format you think will be helpful, you know, whatever, whatever. So let me just, I've got a couple of things that I use, but, um, you know, just the idea of that radiating set of ideas or the complicated system of ideas, however you want to do that. Um, you know, it starts with that uh, powerful list or the power list, and then it evolves. And I was even thinking, Courtney, that, you know, uh, and this thing of, of the of others is you might ask your students to say, so what are the help them have them give them a brainstorm task? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I did that with um, multiplication one a few. This was back when um, what was it? Assessment. EDU 605, was it? In the fall. Yeah, in the fall. And I had asked, what is multiplication? And the kids came up with the power list. And then mm -hmm. they actually wrote it on sticky notes and we kind of moved them around. And then we made a class web mm -hmm. about multiplication, which was really helpful. Um, so yeah, I think maybe I'll do that on Monday when we get back. <laughs> well, Here's what I got. Tell me what you think. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, I forgot this is a vacation week. Hey, happy vacation. <laughs> 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 I keep thinking, you know, I've got grandkids down in uh, Portsmouth and one of them goes to school in Maine. She's on vacation. The others are in New Hampshire. Their vacation is next week. So I'm all, I'm all confused. Okay, so those are some good thoughts so far. So, um, Brian, how about you? Yeah. Um, I think I'm doing a lot of compiling and analyzing at this point in time. I was looking at some of your feedback and how you are trying to have me, I think, inadvertently take a step back and look at it before I just kind of keep going. And that's what I'm really taking this week to do. I've got a lot written down so far on this paper, far more than I thought I'd have. Mm -hmm. up to this point so mm -hmm. i'll try to take a step back and analyze that and make sure it's what i want to have on the paper i try to add my own personal touch to the data as well kind of like where my own perspective comes into play and then really just taking this next two weeks um to finalize all the information i have and and make some conclusions about what i want to do next with this data and kind of like what you were saying i think i want to look for next steps and not necessarily give a conclusive, this is what I have for information, more of like, a, this is what I've got, I've gathered so far, there's some things that I've discovered, but here's what I would like to do next with the information. Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that and that certainly makes, makes, um, I think, a, a, gives you a better sense of the perspective that you have now. Perspective is that the, as the action researcher, you can see things that are going to go ahead and things are going to happen after this course. But it, the perspective is I just need to let that go and take its course. I can make reference to it. But what I'm going to do now is step back and do a, you know, uh, a written report or a paper, if you will, on what I've done. Yeah. And the, the exemplars, the templates from 
prior students have really helped. I've been looking at those a lot and trying to figure out how to frame myself based off of what I've seen yeah. in yeah. the past. And that's been, yeah. that's been helpful too. So Yeah, and I think that, that you can see, first of all, that um, the papers don't go on at length. I mean, somewhere, I, I'm, I know my courses, it's somewhere around 15 pages, I get exhausted reading. I mean, 15 pages of text, that's a lot, double space. Um, you know, when I have doctoral students and dissertations, then we read hundreds of pages. And it's like, okay, here we go. But that's not here. That's not now. That's somewhere in your future. <laughs> Just copy and paste it, put it on chat BT and say, what are the oh, I know. Don't, don't start me back. <laughs> you know, and Justin, as soon as I said that, you know, and as soon as you were saying exemplars, I'm thinking, you know, I kind of have my own little chat GPT thing. Going there. Yeah, no, I won't have more than that much text. I definitely have some visuals in my appendix that I'll exceed the 15 pages, but yeah. not more than 15 pages of text, that's for sure. <laughs> well, and you can see that's a really good point that, that some of the appendices go over and above. And you can see we've already used some of the, the machine work. You know, we've done Tag Crowd, we've done uh, the uh, Word Cloud. Those are strictly machines, strictly driven by numbers. Nothing very um, qualitative about that at all. It's just straight, you know, frequency. So we already have kind of, we've already used some of those tools. Um, so I think that as you're saying, and I, what I did like about this pay, three pager is that there was a lot of good ideas. It, it, it's starting to build. I can see where people are starting to see the next step. I can see where, um, there are places where I'm, I'm really going to recommend that people back back out and or that you draw the line stop and you know this is this is your work this is your class no more um so that that and i provided that kind of feedback on the rubric and um, brian and i were talking and i just want to make sure is ever you're all able to open the rubrics that i attached to your to your three pager i just uh i know that what that's that's something i is a it's a great tool when it works. It's all great when it works. <laughs> but I, I see mine, Jeff, but I don't see any feedback on it. So I don't know if it really. Yeah. Well, okay. Okay. Well, I just that's good. Good to know because I'm going to look on my. Okay, I'm going to reattach that or send. I can send okay. that to or you. Email it. Yeah, you can email it to me too. But uh, yeah, but that's. So if I've, I wonder how I managed to do that. Um, but it's good, always good to know that I've got some of the, at least it worked in in uh, practice. And let's see. I'm going to take that one out and put another one on there, and then we'll move on. So I'm going to, there you go. And if you hit your refresh now, you should have something. So what I wanted to do in uh, the next oh, half hour or so, and then we'll see if we can bring this to a close by 6.15, seeing as how it is your vacation, is... And I'd like to take some vacation too, you know. <laughs> I want to ride this piggyback too. Um, I wanted to go ahead and uh, there we go. Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Share this presentation slide. So you can all read the presentation slide, okay? Yeah, okay, good. So this is about how do we bring qualitative and quantitative together? Um, I'm assuming that this is something that everyone is kind of contending with and uh, struggling with a little bit. So that's the topic. Um, and I found, I was just, interestingly enough, guess what's happened here in the School of Ed? All of a sudden uh, at our big school-wide meeting, we get a, a, someone reading a land acknowledgement. I'm like, okay. That, I and people are saying, oh, it's just that's just reading. I'm like, no, I don't think so. I think that's thinking, and I think it's intentional. 
So I went and found another land acknowledgement from Mount Desert Island. I just think it's a much different one than we've done before. And I just wanted to say that this is what I think this effort can lead us to is just kind of discovering and thinking about land differently. And, you know, as I say this, land can mean different things. Land can mean things that have to do with the nature of the land itself, the dirt, in other words, you know, the, the, the what it is matters. It's not just that we owned it or we're here, it's that it has its own meaning. It has its own value. So that's, the I think, the more um, uh, indigenous way of looking at land and at dirt is that it is a, uh, uh, an active living part of our world. So here he is. Open Table MDI acknowledges that we are on the island of Pizamkuk and the ancestral land of the Wabanaki people of the dawn. So Pizamkuk, I'm assuming, is Mount Desert Island. We respectfully acknowledge and hold gratitude to the many indigenous people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations, to their elders, both past and present. We can recognize the rich history of this land reaching beyond colonization and the establishment of European colonies. We recognize its significance to the indigenous peoples whose practices and spiritualities were tied to and nourished by the land and water and sky, and who continue to develop in their relationship to the land and its other inhabitants today. We acknowledge the vibrant communities of the Abenaki, the Wallastukuk, Malatsi, Mikkamak, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations and all of the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is known as Eastern Canada and Northeastern United States, specifically New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, Eastern Quebec, Maine, and Vermont. We make this acknowledgement aware of continual violations of water, territorial rights, and sacred sites in the Wabanaki homeland. So this um, reminds me to um, ask you all whether or not you've seen the movie Dawnland. Have any of you seen Dawnland? Brian, you've seen it? Have, have you heard of the movie Dawnland, Justin and Courtney? Oh yeah, I've heard of it. I haven't actually seen it. It's about 50, it. 50 minutes long. Yeah. Brian, what what what's your do you remember? It's been a, a while since I've I've watched it. I just know that uh for one of my courses in high school we watched it. Right. It's a it's a movie made of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that um, was uh, a uh, government a, a state government sponsored and uh, Wabanaki Reach sponsored um, endeavor in 2015 to um, have the uh, Wabanaki uh, people who were um, taken from their home as children and put into the English schools, if, for want of a better word, uh, and for them to tell their stories and to um, really, really wrestle with this deep emotional trauma to their lives. Um, and it also was for us to recognize how people now are in many in many ways trying to resolve the conflicts but still have little opportunity to do that uh and the truth and reconciliation commission came and went and that's kind of where what they were i, I just saw it last week again here on campus um and and it's one of those movies that reminds us we we need we need to have space created for us to talk and think about our history. For me, a lot of this, and, and Courtney, I don't think there's any, um, for me, it's no surprise now that DEIB, D this diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work should, should reside in our history courses. Yeah. You know, one of the articles I read was about um, teaching after the Obama administration just in general, it was speaking mostly, most specifically about black history, but, mm -hmm. um, 
and it was interesting because it you know it really was like talking about it as same same like talking about social studies is talking about DEIB and just how we can make it um you know just a part of what we do it's and across just all the content areas as well well it's hard and and that was one of the things that I was trying to um to to one of the messages I was trying to send is that looking at history doesn't mean we can't look at mathematics data visualizations are math they're the math of our history. You know, it's history counts kind of thing, if you want to play words. So it's really an important thing. And that's kind of what led me. And I'm a history buff. I can read history all day. And, and it tells me things that are important for now. But that was something that, in the terms of policy and profession and everything, made it look and sound and feel differently. And our students bring different methodology for solving problems in math um you know depending on where they're coming from um and so yeah highlighting those pieces as well you know I like how you can pull the history into it but also the multicultural mm -hmm. multilingual piece as well um yeah yeah okay so here we go with the with the rest some other ideas here so I, I said, you know, and, and you were hinting uh, at, and I think this is one of those things that is a call for everyone, that you don't need any more data. What you need to do is look at the data you have. You're better served by going back and looking again. That's what research means. Look again, look again. Don't look forward, look again. Step back, look again. So this is, this is you know, deeper thinking. Um, you know, making those notes, creating maps, doing the things that are sparked by continual reflection on your, um, on on the the say the qualitative data that you've collected, or even the quantitative data. And as you resolve these things, next step is the eight pager, in which you probably are going to have a little bit more to say about the beginning, the research questions, the literature review. Um, one of the things I noticed in the literature reviews that was uh, very valuable was if you were making, and this is really, I love this part, if you were making a connection with EDU 600, that means we've made a connection across courses. <laughs> that, that's a huge victory <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and so I, I'd like you to say that in your narrative, like these articles are primary research and these are the things that are important about these articles. Um, and, and begin to write about them from this point of view. They contribute content ideas, you know, about history or about technology or about gardening, but they also give you some glimpse of how people have studied this. So if you have, a, a you know, some survey questions that you're gleaning from an article or a, um, you know, a, 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 some interview questions or, or kind of categories for interpretation you know, those are the things that help that those primary research articles have a function in your study. They not only just are there literature to talk about, but they're actually contributing to the active construction and the active um, steps in analysis of the data that you have. So I think those they're good for, for a number of reasons. Um, Okay, here's a here's my doodling for what a literature review of assessment would look like. So I use the tree metaphor. I could you see the roots? <laughs> if you see the roots down there, so down deeper are the older, more important kind of roots. But as I look at this, this this could even be I could redo this, and I'm a little chagrined at a couple of things, but I, I'm not going to get too worried about that. But what this says is there are so many people there are about. 30 different references on this tree. Well, this is a just a graphic. You can use graphics. You know, if you, I, that was one of the things I liked, Justin, when I, you know, uh, first met you. It's like, oh, here's a graphic. And there was all this kind of English garden thing that you used uh, to, uh, and almost like a maze. 
uh, that kind of went in and out of the center idea, central idea. Yeah, and so, the different content areas, right? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Uh, those are great to play with. And this is this is one that, um, you know, I thought, you know, people, you know, think all the time about how do you how do you step back and make an idea more vivid or animate something? Well, you just need to take some time. And this took me a couple of hours to do, but, you know, a couple of trials and errors, but it's worth it. You know, the, the, this helps to embed the ideas more deeply and give you a chance to reflect on what the connections are and why you're putting things there or here or some other place. And it's not that this is a, a perfect representation. It is just that it is a representation. Things can always be done differently. And the one... Um, the lesson, you know, remember the 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 big fascination with Howard Gardner uh, and multiple intelligences. Do you all remember that, Brian? Do you remember Howard Gardner and multiple intelligences? I do. Yes. Well, anyway, and, and Justin, do you? Do you yes. Does that name yes. ring a bell? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, one of the things he did with, that was really cool is he um, had, wrote a book called Habits of Mind, in which he took. Um, exemplars of these different intelligences and wrote about them. And he wrote about Pablo Picasso, uh, about the artistic intelligence. And one of the things that he, the stories he told about Picasso was how he created one of his most famous works, Guernica, of the, you know, the uh, beginning of World War II in Spain and the bombing of a town, Guernica. And he said, and the story he told was that this painting that he did was one of a, a, at least 60 different versions of the same thing. And that really, that's like, that hit me. It's like, hmm. And I'd seen, I've seen artists and I had a, my mom was a, a painter and I know she did versions of the same thing. I mean, she practically, and once I think thought about it, it's like, geez, he was just painting three things over and over and over again. <laughs> she loved to paint the Madonna and child. Oh my God, the Madonna and child is everywhere. <laughs> she loved to paint fruit. And many and scene and scenes. And if you look at the front of the research literacy book, there's the winding road. Do you know where I got that from unconsciously? from her paintings. She painted winding roads in New York, upstate New York countryside over and over again. And it took me, took me a while to realize that that's a subconscious idea <laughs> that I had. So anyway, keep going with your visuals. So here's a couple of, of ideas that I wanted to just make sure that you had uh, in your in, in mind that there are some, uh, let's see, I'm gonna make it bigger so we can view it here. So these, there. This is not anything new, it's just telling you that you have the qualitative data and where it goes. Now the page numbers might be different, but the figure should match to, regardless of what version you have. So this is if you're just doing qualitative. We have the you know, upper box, which is collection of data, the middle boxes, which are the uh, deep coding and the deep analysis, the meaning making. And then we have the fourth box where things are brought back together again and expressed in writing. And you see right in the middle there, it says creating a visual display of the categories and patterns. That's another reason why I like this book is because it explicitly says, please do some drawing in. So let me just stop there. Any, some thoughts on this? Yeah, makes sense. It aligns well with the template we did for the interviews. Um, I can see that with the predetermined emerging categories. Yeah, I, I in fact, in fact, in fact, once I started to really adopt this textbook with some more 
thought, I, I switched around. I, those categories were, those columns were named different things. And I said, no, I need to align with this so that I'm not confusing people. I know I'm confusing people enough already. <laughs> I just need, I just need to align here. Okay, so let's look at the um, the quantitative, and then we'll look at mixed methods. Okay, so I'm, I'm you know, this this um, it, PowerPoint is available, and you can take a look at it later. Oh, there's the checklist for qualitative data. See, I love this book. That this little end of chapter seven goes from great maps to great lists. And interpretation of quantitative data. Well, I think I got this one out of line there. Okay, so quantitative data, there's a whole other, maybe another graphic there, maybe 7.16 shows you quantitative data. But if you're doing quantitative data, I think some, you know already, Brian, you've, you've uh, taken the data from numeric form and created graphs. That's pretty much as far as you can go. You might do, there might be something else you could do, but let's just say um, that I would suggest that you work um, with your bar graphs and your line graphs before you go to a pie chart. Um, and don't overfill a graph with too much stuff. If you have any questions, send it to me. And I know I've, I've got the visual displays of data to look at, so get feedback on those um, in the next couple of days. But quantitative data isn't so different, uh, isn't so difficult, but you do need to, if you do incorporate it into your paper, um, I would say you might want to, 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 to use like a space in there and say C figure 1.2 and then put it in the appendix. Because if you start interleaving these things, I don't want you to do wraparound text. That's just hard to read. And it reduces the size of the graph. So it's hard for me to read. Yeah. I want to get the full benefit of the data, the, right, the big picture, literally the big picture. OK, now here's where we get to the mixed methods. And I think some of you, I, if not all might be thinking, how do I mix qualitative and quantitative? And in this way, in this graph, you can see that <clears throat> timing matters. When something happens matters. So for this course um, and for this study, I had you start off doing interviews. So I think it, it is a good choice given the constraints of time we had and given the fact that we need to learn some of the methods of interviewing and of data analysis. So we started off, I think we're pretty much on the top row. So we started with the qualitative, then you might have done some quantitative. And then you're bringing them together. That That's kind of where, I, Brian, I mean, you, you're done a little bit more than this. J Justin, you said, oh, I think I might do some surveying, but maybe not, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> well, not, so I'm what, not sure that the, the, the data I can get out of it in the time frame is going to be useful to me in right, where I'm right. at. So. Right. And so but what I, that means, it, it's, it's important to note that because what that means is the size of the circles get bigger or smaller depending on how much weight you're putting on the qualitative or the quantitative, or both. So, so oh. yeah, go ahead, Courtney. I was going to say, the quantitative data that I put together came from end of unit data we had after teaching westward expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to my colleagues and I collected information about the historical themes score that they gave each of their students. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was planning to use it to kind of um, justify some of the decisions I decide to make about how to end the Civil War unit and talk about Reconstruction. Um, and in addition to that, I, I had some NWEA data around informational information um, reading mm -hmm. and comprehension. And so I 
I kind of threw that in there, but I'm not sure. I was thinking again, it could be used as justification for the choices around um, strategies, teaching strategies. But is that is that using the quantitative yeah. data in a way sure. that makes sense? I guess. It, well, it, it well it, you're doing classroom research, so I don't as as teachers, I think, and as someone who who is necessarily collecting that the the quantitative data definitely use it it's it's kind of the what would you call it the the classroom validity mm -hmm. of what you're doing or instructional right. validity i mean we can just put the word validity which means you're you're explaining what you're doing and then you're using a measure to help to quantify or to um measure the uh the outcomes or the effects or the results so it does matter. It just what it what it, what it then does is it might change what where it goes in terms of sequence. Because this data now, if you look at what you're talking about, you collected quantitative data prior to your qualitative data. Because that unit was before. Yeah, <laughs> technically, I didn't think about it until after. But yes, I right. But that's but that's the been... whole point is that this data right. is there. You've done this yeah. qualitative thinking, and then the, you know an additional quantitative, uh, you know, data would be not now, but in the future, the re results from unit that you're working on. Westward, yeah. no, I forgot. Civil, where are we yeah. at? Westward? Yeah, enslave. Yeah, enslavement. Yeah. Okay, so okay. so that's how that works, but it also then says the the relative amount of data for your action research to me would be that the quantitative data is a smaller a sm a lesser weight than the than other data. Your qualitative data, you become. I, I'm just kind of putting words in your mouth, so I want you to kind of rebut this if you will or or kind of explain but you get the idea so how would you see if you were asked to how how would you weight these two how would you do that courtney well i think because i'm looking at grade data you know i think it's important to to remember that that can be subjective right and based on I, we have standards, but, you know, I looked at my colleagues' scores and, and the scores of my students in my own classroom. And so I think that there's that piece. But for that reason, I think the quanti I'm sorry, the um, qualitative data, the interviews um, that I that I had um, done, like what teachers are saying is working. Um, and then having the, you know, that seems to me like it has the greater weight, right? Like the, okay, fine. Most of the kids met the standard um, in the la at the end of the last unit, but mm -hmm. that doesn't really mean anything if, if I'm not considering what strategies got them to that point. Mm -hmm. And the information that I have about that, I got from my interviews my qualitative interviews. Right. So, so and I think you get the idea of, of, them, right. of what, what that sequence means and right. then what the relative weight is. And so I think that's good to keep in mind is, sure. um, and, and it, it, for this course, now I'm not, this isn't to say that in every course it's like this, but in this course, in this, you know, accelerated seven week unit that we have here, this is what's happened. And I think that's, you you can see that it does depend on different studies. Justin, I think in the same kind of way, you've got different points, different points at which you're emphasizing one thing or the other, but um, how would you say that you are weighting those two things now? Oh, well, definitely. Like you mean in terms of the quantitative and qualitative, definitely yeah. far more on the qualitative right now. Um, I haven't done... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a really big part of it because a lot of it is just sort of trying to gather what people think, uh, understand how to make something happen, right? And so uh, mm -hmm. 
I definitely, I want to get a little bit of quantitative data as well, um, just mostly from some staff and maybe the administration. Although, yeah, so it's far more important. And I think there's a lot of quantitative data out there, you know, like the, uh, you know, there's a lot of mixed methods research in terms of the literature that supports these, you know, the puzzle pieces coming together. Um, there's some out there. Uh, and so I might just kind of lean on, I don't know if I'm allowed to, but that's what I was just planning on. Well, you certainly on no, leaning no, no, on you, that and no, just saying, like, here's where I want to explore it more. No, you can. You can you can go out and and I was just thinking the same thing like you were saying, go out, but you were saying go to the literature. But you know, there are some statewide surveys that have been done yeah. by the Maine Environmental Education Association right. in the right. last year that are quantitative. Yes. So and I think they all validate what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And those, you know, I if you if you look at that as another yet another source of quantitative data. It, it's it's not like it's the big weight. Your weight really is more in the on the other side, in uh, term in in terms of you know what what it is you're really uh, able to collect yourself personally. It's been much more uh, qualitative. So yes, you know, th and that's I don't I'm I'm not gonna say say in any way that that makes it lesser or more or anything. Each of these is different in its own way. It's just that action research to, to its best um, purpose is research that's explained in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with and then what you've uh, with what you've done with what you've um, collected so that's that's the that's the the that's the takeaway for today I think is you don't need more you need to interpret what you have Yes, yes. And so here's the the follow up question about, you know, how do we how do how do you reconcile the two qualitative and quantitative? That's what the mixed method step does. And I think it's a good step. It's not so because you if you didn't think about it like this, you'd be wondering, well, geez, how am I going to reconcile these two? Uh, what ba upon what basis? So there's two things we've talked about. What happened when sequence and which one is really the more dominant or are they of equal weight? So what is the weighting? What's the sequence? What's the weighting? And then of course the interpretive is how the ideas fit together. But I think the other two can help you get there. And this is a great set of questions for how you get, how you really make sense of that mixed methods data. More, more, more good questions. Um, I think I especially want to point to number five here. And number six, Justin, you just said something that said, suggests you're already thinking about how your results fit with your literature. Well, you should be thinking like that. The literature is not an inert blob sitting there. It's, it's something that has a connection with not only the way you've designed your study, but with the interpretation of your study. So you can reach back into your literature and pull that into the interpretation, interpretation as well, as well as understanding what are the limitations of the study. Time is certainly a limitation here. So we gotta you know, figure out what's happening. And so the limitation also is that um, the, the study is going to wait the qualitative a little bit more than the quantitative, knowing that we can do the quantitative in the in the future. So when they say more studies need to be done, you're already saying, and this is what I'm going to do. I mean, that's such a lame old kind of thing to say at the end of a study. More work should be done. Tell me what you're going to do. Well, that leads to more funding, right? <laughs> it's it's the way we it's the way we keep ourselves in a job. This is part of what we do. Um, yeah, you've already done this. This is what you're talking about. Um, I put rubric scores in there uh, because they they are the uh, for many classroom assessment um, uh, situations. They're so important, and you can use them. Rubrics are great, and met and doesn't meet is a great way of portraying students or meets and exceeds or however you however you do it. And there's the create a graph tool 
Don't pay no attention to that date at the bottom of the page. I did have a quick question about that quantitative data display. I I put in my data tables and my um, bar graphs, but I didn't really write anything about it. I just mm -hmm. um, put them in there. I assume that comes in the in the paper, but I just I wasn't sure. I did submit it on Brightspace, but I didn't know if you were looking for it an explanation of how oh, it, it you know it, it it's a what i'm trying to do there is to develop that um connection and and again link the qualitative and the quantitative because displaying a, a bar chart is great but you also need to explain it which is more right. about accessibility um and so if you're really if you were going to do this so for me, I mean, I understand you put the, the bar chart there and you're going to write about it, but it's good practice. Uh -huh. um, oh, you know, and I don't know if you're going to use this in your study, but it's just good practice to just write a couple of sentences about what you put there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just, I can I'll add that in and just submit it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so that's that's my that's the I think the heart of the matter today is really trying to find the endpoint. And then also try to understand how do we mix qualitative and quantitative. And just think we started with chat GPT and here we are. Okay. So Brian, what's the what's the what's your what are your closing thoughts? Um I think I'm gonna go back before the end of the weekend here and review the, what I have so far on my Current paper, I'm going to add in some additional detail about the um, specific measurement methods that I've been using to collect data, as well as I have already started some information about the limitations and kind of um, how I collected the data. So I want to add some more uh, to that, but then I want to focus more, I think, as I end up this weekend with just making sure that my my visual representations are up to date and, and top notch. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about you, Justin? Uh, I I really want to go back and I got to go back again. I had wrote down look again and I drew two little eyeballs for the circle for the O's. <laughs> so I'm like, look again. It's like big font on my notes here. Um, and I'm actually working with these four high school students right now. In eighth grade, they did a project where they rebuilt our pizza oven like out of out of clay. Yeah, And so as a senior project, they're rebuilding it, but then also building um, a, a roof shed style roof structure. And we just got we just got it all framed in today because um, one of them is a, our carpentry student at PADS. That's a technical high school, the Vol Volk School in Portland. So anyhow, I actually want to go and I, I know you're not saying not to add on more, but I would like to do a group interview with them. I was just thinking about this uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow while I still have them about mm -hmm. their experience in outdoor education, because, you know, they've they've spent their high school career dealing with COVID and like with what the school's done with getting students mm -hmm. outdoors. And they're, they're all very hands-on students. So it's kind of cool that they did this project four years ago in a micro way and now they're doing it again. Anyhow. So that's sort of, I just want to get that data added in um, as yeah. students. Um, and I'm also super excited about the, um, the visualization that you were talking about at the beginning too, just mm -hmm. sort of getting some visualizations of how all these different stakeholders come into play for what I'm doing um, and uh, and sort of the rewards. I don't know. I'm, I have some thoughts turning on that. So I'm going to explore that a little bit over the next 48 hours before mm -hmm. I get back to looking yeah. deeper into my interviews. You know, and um, just as a, 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 I'll push it a little further. You might, if you're going to do a focus group interview, um, about what their experience doing this outdoor kind of activity is that what you're thinking um yeah just well not just this activity in fact probably less about this activity but more about their experience yeah in in going through the last four years or so of school where the school has kind of created these outdoor you know what's happened and what what it's been like i'm 
I, I have a feeling I know what they're going to say. Um, <laughs> okay. But they're also tend to be a little bit sort of less connected students just because of the nature of who they are. So it's kind of okay. interesting. Uh, I would So so with, with that, as a way for them to pre-think and individualize their responses, I would give them a prompt and say, create a create a map of what your last four years have been in terms of this prompt. What's been, or something like this, what's been the influence of outdoor learning on your experience in school and let and say i want you to map it out and then we're going to talk about it yeah um that's a great idea thank you because i was thinking about doing a map with some high school students that i'm with next tuesday just about gardens and being outdoors but i think with these this this four group of boys that happen to be boys um i think that's a great yeah that's a fantastic way so i think i, I have an idea of how we'll do that we're going to use the whiteboard and post-it notes and stuff like that so mm -hmm. i'd like them to sort of they seem to be creative, creative thinkers when you get the juices flowing in them. So yeah, well, well, when you give them a chance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. Okay, all right, Courtney. I'm do I'm done playing around with stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar idea. I think um, as as Justin, I I wrote down, go back and look again, make notes, maps, post its. I just got to get a handle on. Um, how I'm going to organize things, I think. Um, and that's, that's sort of where I'm at. So, you know, yeah. and, and organizing things. So if you create a map, that's one organizer, but if you, if you, if you think about a, another organizer, sequence is a, a timeline is an organizer. Mm -hmm. That's not bad. It's yeah. not a bad one. Um, so those are, you know, there's no, there's no one way, but that's, that's makes sense in terms of trying to explain it. Because we already have, you know, the introduction, the lit review, and then you're talking about how do we organize results, right? How the just this what happened. Right. Okay. Good. All right. Well that's it. Good thoughts. See you next week, Jeff. All right, thanks. And so the, next week we'll meet one more, and then we do a kind of a round robin presentation in two weeks. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Hey, great. Fantastic. Enjoy the rest of your vacation. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.